Hi, my name is Veronica Smith, and my paper is called Frank Lloyd Wright and Jens Jensen, Driving Forces of the American Future. Frank Lloyd Wright and Jens Jensen epitomized the shift in American design towards the crafting of a national aesthetic. Both men were largely self-educated, and both men drew heavily on their childhood experiences of the natural world as inspiration for their professional work. Additionally, both Jensen and Wright were famed for their forceful personalities. Where Wright was intense and argumentative, often embroiled in public scandal, Jensen was equally intense in his advocacy for public green space, though he avoided personal ruination in the gossip columns. Wright and Jensen settled in Chicago during the same period, and both men had offices in Steinway Hall. Jensen and Wright were also members of the same literary and social groups, including the Cliff Dwellers, a club dedicated to supporting the arts in Chicago. Their well-documented professional relationship began in 1908 and lasted some 20 contentious years. Beyond their tenuous friendship, both designers were keenly aware of the moral and psychological effects of well-designed spaces. While Jensen and Wright often accepted commissions from extremely wealthy patrons, both equally strove to make the beauty of the Midwestern landscape accessible to a broader demographic. However, their respective methods of doing so were sometimes at odds, particularly when it came to the role of the automobile. Believing architecture to be a moral force capable of changing society, Wright's utopian plan for an egalitarian and utilitarian community was never realized. However, Broadacre, as he called the suburban and self-sustaining architectural vision, was Wright's obsession for years. First addressing the issue of American decentralization in 1932 through a piece in New York Times Magazine and in his book, The Disappearing City, Wright proposed the cure for American ills to lie in localized government, as well as high-speed communication and transportation. Broadacre called for individual family homes arranged in small, loosely defined neighborhoods. Governed at a county level, these communities would consist of 1,400 families and would occupy about four square miles. Detractors sometimes interpreted Broadacre as the origin of American sprawl and point to the automobile-dependent community hubs, the lack of housing density, and the standardized manufacturing proposed by Wright's model. Alternately, advocates often cite Wright's combination of community-specific agriculture with the architect's expectation that every family own a couple of chickens and maintain a small family farm. Regardless of the interpretation of Wright's unrealized vision by both contemporary critics and subsequent generations, Broadacre did present a pastoral and romantic alternative to the lines of block housing extolled by Le Corbusier and other European architects. However, one facet of Broadacre was actualized, the Usonian house. Intended to meet the living needs of the lower middle class by providing a high quality, if small, dwelling, the Usonian house was more cost-effective than Wright's other designs. The Jacobs home in Madison, Wisconsin was the first of these houses. Designed in 1936, Wright wrote about his first Usonian home in the January 1938 edition of Architectural Forum, stating, quote, what would be really sensible in this matter of the modest dwelling for our time and place? to give the small Jacobs family the benefit of the advantage of the era in which we live. Many simplifications must take place. What are the essentials in their case, a typical case?" End quote. One such essential was the car and subsequent carport, a semi-enclosed structure that Wright claimed as his own invention. The carport simultaneously provided shelter for the family automobile while still allowing the contours of the vehicle to be visible. Obviously, Wright appreciated the aesthetic quality of the automobile as well as its function. From utopian visions of cooperative communities to the realization of the Usonian house, it is clear that Wright, like Jensen, was fixated on maximizing the living experience of people from all socioeconomic backgrounds. Yet, unlike Wright, 
Jensen's vision of an ideal living experience was less focused on structures and more focused on how those structures interacted with the natural landscape. Because of his proclivity towards using native plant material and crafting landscapes that closely echoed the indigenous terrain, some patrons noted that Jensen's designs almost obscured the architecture, such as his design for the fort seen here. In direct opposition to Wright, Jensen believed that personal cars had no place in America's future. In his work, The Clearing, Jensen mused, quote, and it will not be at all surprising if the city of tomorrow excludes the automobile. Today, the automobile rules and it destroys the parks as gathering places for the multitudes. The architectural beauty of the buildings is lost in the sea of cars that today line the streets. The car has done much to destroy the finer feelings in man, and in the tomorrow it will have to keep its place." End quote. Instead, Jensen believed that, quote, the art of walking would come back as a healthy necessity, end quote. Indeed, he intended his designs for the West Parks Commission to be encountered on foot. Columbus Park in Chicago, in particular, was made for strolling. Officially designated a National Historic Landmark in 2003, the park was Jensen's first and only opportunity to create an entirely original place of recreation for the people of Chicago. Jensen viewed this commission as the closest he had ever come to realizing a native Illinois landscape in his designs. The site was already used informally as a golf course due in part to the indelibly flat terrain. A small brook bisected the area near the north side of the property and railroads and factories lay to the south. Jensen maintained the openness of the center of the park to suggest the broad expanse of the prairie and the flatness of the land was accentuated through the planting of hawthorns and other horizontally branched trees. Several irregularly shaped clumps of trees segmented the expanse so that the boundary of the park would not be completely visible at any time and the space would seem infinite. Walkways lined the perimeter, encouraging leisurely strolls. Additionally, Jensen spent two years in negotiations with the city to divert West Harrison Street, which originally traversed the park. The street ended up on the park's southern boundary. Though Jackson Boulevard had to transect the park, Jensen gently curved the street to the north to create a transitional zone between the park proper and the adjacent neighborhood. These accommodations reiterate Jensen's belief in the need for spaces to void of vehicles. Clearly, Jensen saw his role as that of a messenger to the city inhabitant, reminding the urbanites of, quote, the country outside his city walls, end quote. Columbus Park as well, as Jensen's writings about nature, reaffirm his philosophy of harmony and reverence, a philosophy that de-emphasizes mankind's influence on nature. In conclusion, though Jensen and Wright had similar philosophical goals, such as reconnecting man and nature, and that design could be a shaper of human morality, their views of the place of the automobile within American society